Um, so this is going to be a little bit unusual. As I've told some of the people about what I was talking about today, lots of people said to me, wait a minute, you're not talking about spatial cognition, and you're not talking about individual differences. And I said, quite frankly, I'm not talking about my research at all. And they said, what, a talk without Legos? There are Legos in there. Um, I'm just not going to actually talk about them. So that's kind of your where's Waldo thing. You know, can you find the Legos in my slides? What I'm going to talk about instead is going to sound a lot more like a commentary. I'm going to draw upon uh, some pieces uh, from what I call the research practice gap. So uh, I'm going to make some terminology uh, judgment calls, um, and hopefully I can keep you with me on those. But I'm going to start by saying that I don't think I have to sell to anyone in this room that it's important to study the science of learning, but I want to give you the frame of mind that I use when I'm thinking about why we study the science of learning. And I want to break it down into sort of there's two really serious goals that I always have when I'm thinking about my work. And the first is discovery. And that's really this, we were just talking before with uh, Patricia about the reward of, of knowing something, the reward of understanding something. I think we are driven by that quite a bit. And a lot of what we do in science is driven by that, that desire to understand. So how something happens, why something happens, and what makes things happen. And what really we are doing in science also is um, we're, we're solution driven. We're doing this for some purpose um, that is, in addition to the curiosity, it is knowledge to improve the world in some way. Whether it's at this very level of a richer understanding just makes us uh, stronger as intellectual individuals, whether it's to inform further development, or whether it's to inform practice in some way. And so, just to give you my mindset, I think of my work in terms of discovery plus solutions. And this is what I call a translation-minded fundamental science approach. So that's just to give you kind of my framing of where I came from, which leads to why I want to talk about the things I want to talk about today. To really set the stage, though, um, in 2013, Stephen Rose wrote um, this quote, um, brain imaging has apparently shown that ventrolateral prefrontal cortex lights up when adolescent girls experience social exclusion. But does this provide guidance as to how youngsters might be helped? And I found this quote, very, reson you know, very resonating, very thought-provoking, um, and actually very challenging. Because on the one hand, I actually wanted to agree with it. I thought, well, wow, yeah, that, you know, on the face, the, the validity of that argument, what would this really tell us? But on the other hand, I wanted to defend it. I wanted to say, well, wait, wait, wait. Knowing this might help us depending on what else we know. So for example, in the psychology of persuasion, do we know something about whether understanding the biological underpinnings helps us seek solutions. So would counselors and parents and such, knowing this, would it change the way they approach it? More in line with the kind of work that um, I do and some of the work we've heard about today, we, we actually know quite a bit about the cognitive functions that might be associated with these areas of the prefrontal cortex. We might start to say, well, maybe this gives us a different model of what's happening in social exclusion. And so it might lead to uh, potential solutions or ways to think about solutions. And so what I thought is, well, so is it helpful? I don't know, but it could be. And that could be, though, is predicated on something. That could be is predicated on, on this other knowledge. And that other knowledge, in my opinion, is what we call the research practice gap. That is saying, how would we fill in from, say, this knowledge of the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex to something that could be useful? And so what I'm going to talk about today and focus on is how are we filling this gap between research and practice uh, for the science of learning and education? So I'm going to focus on education. But much of what I'm going to say, I think, is relevant to the way we think about science to practice in general, or at least I hope for it for most of it is. So uh, this is just the basic roadmap of what I'm going to cover. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about what I consider sort of two core approaches to filling this gap in education. One is um, bridge, bringing knowledge to practitioners. The other is um, building the fundamental knowledge itself. For each of these, I'm going to talk a little bit about what has worked. I'm going to talk a lot about potential pitfalls, because I think that's where we learn the most at this point. And then I'm going to end on speculations that I have about what the critical features are for building this bridge. So how do we really fill this gap? What do we know? So I'm going to launch right into these core approaches. So as I said, I, I think when you look at what people are trying to do when they talk about a research to practice gap, there's two things you see in education. One is bringing knowledge to the practitioners. And I'm actually going to distinguish two terms that are often used interchangeably. So if you don't agree with this, that's OK. You just need to keep it for, for today. And I'm going to call that neuroeducation. I'm going to talk about neuroeducation as the teaching of educators about neuroscience. So when we teach educators about neuroscience and cognitive science um, that should inform practice. You're also going to see me very much um, advocating for this use of cognitive. So a lot of this has been couched as neuro, but I think one of the critical pieces here is also that those cognitive functions play a critical role in how we think about it. 
The other side of this is building the fundamental knowledge with problems of practice in mind. That is, what is the research we're doing going to do to inform practice? And I'm going to call that the educational neuroscience. Now again, these are often used interchangeably, but I think making that distinction really does help us talk about what we're doing. So I'm going to jump right into neuroeducation. And the first thing I'm going to do is say, well, why do we think we need this? Why, why teach teachers about neuroscience? And the first reason is that there's long been a push in education or a desire for evidence-informed practices. Um, there's, there's things like what works, where, warehouse, you know, places where people are going to find what's the um, evidence, um, what does the evidence say about how we should practice. And over the last several years, people have really turned to neuroscience to say, are there places in the neuroscience and in the cognitive psychology that tell us a lot about how we should be doing things in education? But one of the bigger drivers underlying this has actually been what we call the brain myths. And again, they've been called brain myths. You could call them educational myths. You could call them psychological myths. Um, you could call them folk psychology. Um, things like you only use 10% of your brain. Uh, people are left or right brained. Um, teaching to a student's learning style will enhance learning. Um, and there's, there's others as well, but these are some of the key ones. And these are things that most neuroscientists will tell you that in some cases, they may be decent metaphors, but these are actually not, do not bear out in the, in the data. And these, we know these persist in the general public. I could actually give a whole talk on the persistence of, of uh, folk psychology in the general public. Um, but what about teachers? Well, there's actually been a lot of work showing how this actually persists in teachers. And I'm just going to show you, just for, for relevance, some, some of the data that we see. Um, so one of the, this is just one of many studies uh, showing that when you actually ask teachers, and these are international teachers, what percentage of teachers believe in myths like the brain, the brain can shrink if you drink less than six to eight glasses of water a day, children are less attentive after sugary drinks, we use only 10% of our brain, exercise can improve the integration of hemispheric brain function. Um, they had actually a whole host of other ones as well. And what they found was that teachers tend to endorse the majority of the things that, that when we dig down deeper, maybe are not the best things for them to be. Uh, emphasizing with their students. Now, some of these you might say, well, that doesn't hurt, because we actually know that drinking water is a, is a good thing, like having glasses of water. So anything that encourages it isn't necessarily bad. Um, but in other cases, they are things that do motivate difficult uh, practices in education. So this has led to people like Eisenhart and Dehan saying things like, well, neuroscience should really be required for all educators in training. So they're talking specifically about how we educate teachers, um, both pre-service and in-service, and then we need to familiarize them with neuroscience in some meaningful way. And what that has led to um, is a whole host of resources that are used uh, for teachers. These come in the forms of just books that, that teachers can pick up that explain different aspects of neuroscience. There's an awful lot of professional development workshops that, that can be attended. Um, there are certificate programs. We actually have um, certificate and master's programs here at, at the School of Education at Johns Hopkins. And all of these are intended to really sort of bring that neuroscience education to the teachers. And so the first thing I want to do is talk about a couple of successes in that domain. So what's going well in that, in that space? Um, so this is just, there's a couple of different examples. This one is uh, Brain U, which is a professional development that's been infused with neuroscience. So a professional development in which teachers learn about brain facts. And what they've been able to show is that, in fact, when you give teachers a Brain 101 kind of course, you get improvements in teacher knowledge. So before they took the Brain U 101, they, on a neuroscience knowledge test, they, they're below 60%. After they do the training, they're up higher. They've got some evidence showing that this lasts, that they actually do remember brain, the brain facts that they learned. In addition, something that is sorely needed in education also is that they improve the confidence of the teachers in their ability to teach. Now, they talked primarily about their ability to teach neuroscience, but there is some evidence that it improves their general efficacy, their comfort in the classroom. So this, again, shows that pre and post training, we're getting these big gains. So this looks like you know, good evidence that the teachers are learning something from the professional development. Um, for anyone who does professional development, we don't often get a whole lot of data on the um, effectiveness of it because of the, the constraints of doing the, the, the work itself. Here at um, Hopkins, some work by Ranji John Bull and Mariel Hardiman. They have a mind-brain teaching professional development as well. They've also used multiple cohorts. And what they tested was the teacher efficacy, so similar to the confidence. That is, um, how, how, how well do you feel you can teach? Um, they had questions on both their personal teaching, but also how much does this kind of training 
Um, how much does it affect general teaching approaches, or would it affect it? And they actually, they're pretty, they're pretty meager results, but they do find that the PD group um, will show higher efficacy than what, they, what were considered very high-end matched controls, uh, individuals with a lot of additional training, and people from the district in general. Not remarkably strong results, but they're in the right direction. And as they continue to build this, the idea is that, in fact, you can build teacher knowledge and you can build teacher confidence. So there are some advantages, at least with respect to teaching teachers about brain facts. Uh, and in this case, if you look at these training, we're talking a lot about the um, underlying cognitive science uh, that, that falls into this, but also information that should help you with those things like those brain myths. But when we dig a little deeper, you have to ask some additional questions. When I started looking at this neuroeducation, because I actually big advocate thinking, yeah, people should know neuroscience and people should know cognitive science. I wanted to know what about student outcomes? So what do we know about how this kind of teaching to teachers is affecting student outcomes? Is it mitigating these myths? Is the, is the, are the myths being mitigated by having this kind of training? And then what role is sort of the persuasiveness or the appeal of neuroscience actually playing in this? So how much of this is the, the flash of seeing uh, brain images affecting the way in which people are thinking about what they do? So first on student outcomes, I'm going to actually put a big fat question mark on that one because it turns out that, and many, many of you who are in education know this, this is actually remarkably difficult to know how to measure. When you've got a bunch of teachers who come to you for a workshop from various places and you're teaching that teacher about information, going back and figuring out how you've actually affected their student outcomes is, is actually strikingly difficult. What you see instead is that when it comes to students in this area of neuroeducation, most of what you see is there has been work, but it's just been a jump right from what we do with teachers to what we're doing with students. So things like um, thinking about the student in specific areas and saying, well, how can this neuroeducation be applied to a specific kind of student that might be involved? Or infusing curriculum for students. So taking the neuroeducation from neuroeducation of teachers to neuroeducation of students. And really that's all that's, that's out there at the moment. So this is an area we desperately need to figure out. If we're going to say that this is something we need to invest in for teachers, we also need to think about whether or not it's actually working for the students that they're teaching. I wouldn't argue that it's not. I just would say we don't know. We don't have the evidence. What about mitigating those myths? Um, there's been a handful of different studies, uh, none of which have directly used the, say, one of the programs and said, you know, how does it mitigate the myths or not? But there are some clues from the literature. This is a study on European teachers. Um, and what they did was they actually measured uh, neuroscience knowledge and interest. Um, you can think of this as how much have they learned about neuroscience? How much do they know? And then they surveyed them on how much they endorsed brain myths as well. And the results were, um, again, not, not dissimilar to the other work that we've seen, which is that there was actually a high rate of endorsing myths among teachers. And Dan and I were just talking about how a lot of this work's been done on teachers, looking at how many teachers endorse brain myths. Um, in all cases, they saw at least 49% of the teachers, often higher. But the really striking result was that the more knowledge they had of brain facts, correct brain facts, was actually associated with greater endorsement of the brain myths. So the same teachers who knew a lot about the brain were also the ones who were most likely to actually endorse the brain myths. Um, what's happening here, uh, the best we can do at this point is speculate. There's a lot of speculation about what it is. One is that the training is not helping them to distinguish between science and pseudoscience. This is something I think we could start to think about how we intervene on. I think there's, there's ways to think about training in that sense. Um, the, the, the key here seems to be that what we might be seeing is an increased confidence with limited knowledge. When you know a little bit, you start to feel more confident, you feel you can actually do it. That's, that's a very natural tendency. Um, I think we all can fall into that trap. So we need to explore this further. We need to figure out what's really going on here. Why are these myths persisting after more training and more knowledge? So um, for me, this is a big one because I'm going to talk a little bit later about the other side of this. And um, mitigating the myths is something that I think could, in some cases, have pretty dramatic effects on the way we think about education. Um, we did some of this with some, some recent uh, professional development here. Um, the number's actually wrong. It's actually 148. Sorry for the typo. We did some we've done some professional development with in-service teachers. Now, let me say, this was not 
data that were collected for this purpose. So they're not the perfect data, but it's going to give you a taste of what we're seeing. And we were able to actually, with the help of the teachers, um, these categories, but that's because they helped us sort of design the categories. We wanted to get information on their background, and this was to help us with what we were doing. And so we got them to indicate how much um, cognition and neuroscience they'd actually had in their background, and we were able to kind of classify that into different levels of, of um, how much experience they had. And then we gave them a brief survey. Survey had a bunch of things in it, including um, understanding of certain educational practices, understanding of some of the cognition, but we included some of the learning styles statements, and that was done for a specific reason to, to make a decision about what we needed to target. And um, we had two kinds of questions in there. We had some on the learning style statement, which is things like teaching to a student's preferred learning style improves learning, or students can be classified as left or right brained. And so we were able to then go back and say, well, wait, let's look across these different pools of, of people where we have this information, and what do we see? Do we see them endorsing these? So these are the data. Um, I drew this black line to show that anything above the black line means they're agreeing with these things. Um, the blue is learning styles, the red is the left-right myth. And what you can see is that regardless of how much training they've had up to the certificate here, they are above this line and in fact seem to be increasing. Again, very preliminary data, not the most controlled um, uh, setting for doing this. It does seem to drop a little bit here with the degree, although again, I would not put a whole lot into the key here. In all cases, they are still endorsing these myths. Okay? So this is just a more, more uh, close-to-home case where even among teachers who are fantastic teachers by most measures that we see, they're endorsing these uh, brain myths. And you, know, you have to ask how that's affecting their classroom. Well, I can tell you directly with these teachers, one of the ways it's affecting their classroom is they're inventorying their students on learning styles every year and trying to figure out how to use that information. So it seems that the training, at least in these initial um, passes at it, really doesn't seem to mitigate endorsing the educational brain myth. Um, and so we're not doing the job we need to, at least on this count. The other piece of this that I think is worth thinking about when we talk about um, the teachers and doing this neuroeducation piece is we know that neuroscience itself is persuasive. There's, um, I think it was, uh, I don't remember, it was reviewer four or five asking about what parts of the brain. People like to know what parts of the brain. They really like that localization. Um, this was a study that was actually done by Weisberg and colleagues um, on explanations. And so they took explanations, they took good ones and they took bad ones um, of various phenomena. And with each one, they gave the explanation with out neuroscience, so just what's the standard explanation, and then they created explanations where they artificially enhanced it with neuroscience, so fake neuroscience. And then they asked people, how satisfying are these explanations? So this is just a question about does adding brain, just adding some superficial brain to the explanation, does it affect what people think? So I'm going to show you three different groups they looked at. They looked at novices. These were people who really had no background in neuroscience. Um, and I think they excluded people who had uh, even intro psychology. Um, neuroscience experts and then cognero students, which they classified because these were students who had had some neuroscience background. Novices um, endorsed the blue and good explanations. They endorsed good explanations and as well as um, bad ones that were infused with neuroscience. So you're seeing an effect of the neuroscience among the novices. So adding superficial neuroscience made the explanations better made them more satisfying. Rest assured, neuroscience experts not only aren't persuaded by neuroscience, but we're apparently not persuaded by um, good explanations either. Um, <laughs> we do not endorse these. We do not. The satisfying ones were the good explanations without neuroscience. Um, we went for the straight uh, facts. So adding the artificial neuroscience is actually bad for neuroscience experts. That's good. That means we're actually able to filter that out, at least to some degree. Um, and so where were these students who have some training? The students who have some training actually were closer to the novices. Um, they are endorsing actually good explanations without neuroscience much lower than what we would hope for. Um, and then when you add the neuroscience, they're endorsing those. They are, again, endorsing bad explanations provided there's neuroscience. So in some ways, they're actually showing even a more substantial impact of having that neuroscience information in there. Now, these are not the same as people who necessarily have gone through a teacher training or something, but they are people with some neuroscience, but not, not as much as, say, an expert, and the neuroscience is very compelling. 
So again, this is just, as my title said, a cautionary tale. I think this raises questions about what we're doing when we talk about neuroeducation. because it suggests how much it matters a lot. So artificial enhancement with neuroscience actually increases credibility when you're talking about someone who is not a non-expert, or at least not yet an expert. So from the neuroeducation side, um, it is bringing potentially useful information to educators. I don't want to suggest that it's not. Um, but I say potentially useful. We have evidence that it's improving their knowledge. They do get the brain facts. And it does seem to be boosting teacher confidence, which again, there should be some advantages to that. But my caution here is that we clearly need more data on the effectiveness. We need to really understand what's happening with these programs. And we need to consider how much training is sufficient. So as someone who, who early on has been a big fan of this kind of work of bringing neuroscience to, to teachers, I think we do need to be cautious about what we're doing in terms of do we really know that what we're doing is having the impact we hope it will. And again, as I said earlier, we don't actually have student outcomes. So in addition to not knowing whether it helps students, we also don't know whether or not it's um, a neutral kind of thing. But from a resource standpoint, we really do need to know it's helping in some way. Now I'm going to switch to the other side of this, which as I said, I'm going to call educational neuroscience. And that's um, the neuroscience and cognitive research driven by and informing issues in education. And I view this, this is kind of where practice-driven questions meet the basic science. That is, questions that you see out in the world of practice really need to intersect with what we're doing in, in our labs and in other spaces. Um, the idea is really to extend what we learn from basic science to problems of practice and aim for more genuine evidence-informed practices. And I'm going to say a couple times over, though, I am not suggesting that basic scientists need to get into the business of doing all the translational pieces. This is more saying that what we generally need to do is think about being practice driven in some of what we do, particularly if you're talking about something in education. There are many, many popular examples I could give you about how people have, have tried to translate science into um, educational practices. Um, there are things, I'm, I am going to talk a little bit about Gardner's multiple intelligences. Um, Dan's actually going to talk more about the brain exercises. But there are other things like taking advantage of plasticity, the advantage of testing for learning, um, the uh, introduction of brain breaks for uh, refocusing attention. Many of these things are things that, that really did stem from various places in basic science, and I could give you a whole host of others. Um, I think we all know that there are lots of programs popping up that um, are in intended to be neuroscience-based. Um, Dan will talk more about what that really means. But the key here is that we are doing these kinds of things, that, that the world is out there bringing things to education. Um, there are some successful translations that, um, and again, I could, I could pick several different examples of these as well. So um, one that I think is, is particularly useful to say that we do this well sometimes um, is that we do things that came from work on dyslexia. So dyslexia has a lot of different components to it, but um, for some time it was really viewed as something was missing, that it was a deficit, that there was a hole in the processing or something was missing. Um, and that it would be qualitatively different from uh, a typically developing brain. But when you actually looked at the brain data and people started to say, well, what are we learning from that? It turns out that it's not entirely qualitatively different. And in fact, one of the key arguments that came from this was that it looks more developmental in nature. There are still, um, there are still some controversies surrounding exactly how to interpret that. But what has happened as a result of that is that there have been certain kinds of training that have really um, emerged from that for dyslexia that have also been able to then be used in other cases of, of, of reading difficulties at different, to different degrees. So this is really a case where knowing something about the brain did change the way people were thinking about dyslexia. And there's been a whole host of other things in, in the dyslexia world that have also tweaked that, that argument as well. So this is a case where people really did the filling in. They did the filling in to figure out how do we go from our original view to flip to a new view and now, now move that out into interventions. Um, but there are an awful lot of pitfalls in the translation as well. And one that's kind of got a good and a bad side to it is um, the, the use of multiple intelligences. So this actually dates back to Gardner. And actually, there's some evidence from before this time as well. But Gardner was the first to fully articulate it, where he, he, he articulated that um, intelligence, for whatever that means, that you as a person and your, your capabilities uh, really come in a multidimensional form. That is, there's lots of different pieces that make you who you are from, from the standpoint of your cognitive abilities. And then a learner is a collection of those strengths and weaknesses. 
Um, this has been grounded very nicely in the multidimensional nature of brain processes in many ways, in terms of being able to say, yes, there are different processes going on. Um, some of the work we've done on individual differences clearly suggests that you have different biases and strengths. But there's a problem, and that is um, when the research started to move from theory to measurable sets of characteristics, we started to see it morph into a new kind of language. Um, people started doing indexes. Um, so we started to see the emergence of things like learning styles inventories or indexes by modality. And I will say the positive here is that it has been highly influential in getting educators as well as others to think about individual differences. I think that's actually a big plus. So in a classically one-size-fits-all education system, it's really nice that we now have this move towards individual differences. I will say it has not proliferated our practices at the level we'd like it to, but at the very least, the acknowledgement of individual differences is important. But what got lost in translation is that this started to peg students into these learning styles. So if you go on, on the web and you actually type in either multiple intelligences or learning styles or classifying learners, you get things like this where it's no longer about you and the things you do, but it's about you being this or you being that. And what we saw in the world of education was that actually became a marker where a lot of schools started and districts started looking at, well, how do I teach to the visual learner? And how do I teach to the auditory learner? And that sounds pretty good on the surface. Like, yes, let's meet students where they are. Um, however, you have to ask again about the effectiveness. And here's where um, the science has really failed to meet the practice, because we actually do know a lot about whether this is effective. And the answer is probably not. Um, there's uh, Pastor did a review of this work. Uh, there's been a lot of different kinds of studies looking at um, the role of preferred learning style, and there's really no evidence that teaching to a single learning style is actually a good thing, period, but certainly matching it to a student's preferred learning style does not seem to have advantages at all. Um, in addition to that, um, we've done some work as well as others on the, the difference between preference and ability. So just because you prefer something a certain way does not mean that's the best thing for you. We see a lot in spatial learning and navigation. People who say they love maps and can't actually read them. Um, on top of that, it's contradictory to our known neural principles. We know that multiple inputs means more connections means better learning. Focusing on any particular modality of learning for any given student is a mistake regardless of whether it's preferred or not in some ways. Because the other piece is that it suggests that learning is about pouring information into a vessel. That's really not what learning is. Learning is about the process of learning, right? becoming a better learner and bringing the content along with it. Um, so, from the, the processing standpoint, we actually know that learning requires effort, that, that the easier you make it, the less likely you are to actually learn something. Um, so don't make it easier on the learner, which again was that matching between styles and, and how you teach. So the reality is that from the standpoint of the cognitive science and the, and the neuroscience underlying it, there's just very little evidence that we should do this. And if anything, uh, a lot of what we're seeing is that you should not. But this is one of the things that is still wildly pervasive. Um, the number of students who take a learning styles inventory in school is staggering. And we're, you know, how teachers use it may be differing, but um, we can be pretty well assured that it's probably not particularly informative. The other area that we see this, a second example, is um, the co-opting of synaptogenesis and exuberant periods. Earlier is better. Um, so we do know that there are exuberant periods early in development. These are the periods of massive brain reorganization. But that message got transmitted into the education world in a way that simply said, earlier is better. That um, this has been used to push learning earlier and earlier. We are seeing a backlash to that in the play movement now, which is excellent. Um, because it suggested that, that, there were that we would have critical periods that would close for learning. And so if you don't start early, you're going to miss it. Um, there may be some things for which that is true, but it got seriously overextended. And that's because it, it, it was overextending very specific data to everything. Um, so you started to see preschools introducing math way too early. Um, and I say way too early only because I want the kids to be playing in the preschool. Um, it was too restrictive for many types of learning. So many types of learning, this doesn't make sense. We're not there yet. Um, and the other really interesting thing about this particular example was that the actual critical data were actually fairly old data from developmental psychology that would feed how you should really think about these critical periods in learning. So it really wasn't about those low-level brain processes and wasn't particularly new. So there's some difficulty just in this case. This is just another case of that massive overextension of the science. So 
Um, in my brief overview of educational neuroscience, there are many promising avenues for translation. We heard some of them today. Um, but we're still struggling with some core issues. One is the overextension. The other is the illusion that we have something new, um, making leaps rather than building bridges. <clears throat> and so that leads me to my sort of, I'm going to cap this off with some speculation about what do I see, having sort of looked at all of this, as some of the key critical features that we're going to need to bridge this gap. And now I really like this gap metaphor, and I like the idea of a bridge building across it. But I have a second graphic that I've been using um, when we think about it in education. Um, and that is this sort of cycle that we have from basic research to applied research to evidence-informed application, and everything in between. Because I think we have a tendency to think about these things as, as individuals. But in fact, there's a lot of gray area. Even in what we heard today, there's a lot of spaces where we heard about doing things in classrooms or you know, moving to different spaces that move you in different places along this uh, spectrum. Um, and so we need to start thinking about what are we trying to understand. So are we asking questions about what works and when and for which people? In that case, something like applied research. Are we asking about why does it matter? We're probably out here in the world where we're trying to connect up the evidence-informed application to basic research. When we're talking about why and how does it work, there's where we're more in the basic, or what I call foundational kinds of research. Um, and then how can we make it work better? That actually often comes from the evidence-based practice. That is, when you're out in the world of practice and you see where it's not working, we can start to think about, OK, what, what information do we need to know to make it better? And so my, my, um, this is sort of a second framing of, of the way I think about this. So when we think about this in the science of learning and education, what does that mean some of these critical pieces are? Well, one is, I'm going to say, knowing your place in this space. So when we think about what we're doing in our research, one question is to ask where we are. So a lot of what we heard about today is right up in here, and we know there's different levels of explanation within the basic research. Um, but we did see some trending down here into, into things that start to sound um, closer to the applied world. And so thinking about the work in terms of what am I actually doing and how far is my reach? What is the coverage I actually have in terms of the way I can think about my data? So how far do my, does my evidence actually go? Um, and then the second is an appreciation for that whole space. Uh, so what additional input would be informative? Not necessarily how do I immediately translate my work, but just what information from these other parts of the space would help me to think about what I'm doing and at what stage? So together, these two pieces are really about that extending versus overextending, understanding, understanding this space. The other one is that the interim steps are critical. So the examples I gave about kind of jumping right from the science into practice um, is really the critical piece of don't leap the gap. The gap is there. It needs to be, it needs to be bridged. And so figuring out how we build those bridges. And I have, to, I have to say, when I think about this, I'm going to be honest and say that understanding the right steps that get you from your evidence to a practice is probably the hardest part, figuring out who's going to do that. I find that to be probably my most challenging piece of all this. When I start to think about the work I'm doing in, throughout the spectrum, I'm always thinking, well, really, where is the critical, where are those critical steps and what do we need to do? And am I really going to do these? Probably not in many cases, but who is? So who do I need to be talking to? A big piece of this also means collaborative teams. So as we've been talking throughout the day and the questions have been coming up, I think we already know in the basic science area that talking to each other helps us an awful lot. And that's true also when you're talking about translation. And this, this goes in two directions. One is the appropriate expertise. So Barbara was mentioning our project on block building where we knew we needed expertise from engineering um, to help us along the way. The other part of it, though, is also stakeholder input. And this goes back to that idea of practice. Who can help you? Who is this likely to affect? And how can they help you as well? So what should that look like? Um, the NSF has been emphasizing um, ad advisory boards more and more for grants. And oftentimes, when you talk to um, how to put together an advisory board, it's not necessarily all other scientists. In, in many cases, it's who's out in the world that this might affect so that, that you can really get that stakeholder input. The other piece is well-defined acceptable evidence. So in the work that Pastor did on learning styles, one of the really satisfying pieces of it was laying out what would I count as evidence? What would I take to be meaningful evidence? And I think this actually speaks to both um, what constitutes support um, and what supports extension of this work as well. And then what's missing from that evidence? So in what we do have. And as I said, I think we're missing an awful lot of evidence on effectiveness. Um, but what would it look like? What would, what would satisfy my, my concern about that? 
And I actually think that this particular piece of well-defined acceptable evidence is something we need to be thinking about both in terms of the way we do the educational neuroscience, that is our actual practice of science, but I think it's also really important um, in the neuroeducation realm as well. That is, when we're talking about how do we teach teachers, we probably need to be thinking about this evidence piece in a very serious way. And that gets back to this whole notion of if they're not distinguishing science from pseudoscience, we're not doing a very good job of teaching them about evidence. And the last piece is one that <laughs> I'm sure Kelly will <laughs> resonate. This will resonate with Kelly very well because um, she's heard me say this and she says it. This relationship really does need to be bi-directional. That is, if we are serious about bridging that gap, um, we need to be thinking from both sides as to how, we're, how our goals are related. Um, and I would argue that what this means is what we're talking about evidence-informed practice when we talk about taking the science and bringing it out to practice. But I also think that we need to be doing practice-minded research if we're serious about these kinds of gaps. <clears throat> that impact and translation will really only happen if we can actually understand each other's goals. So what I'm advocating for here is Practitioners talking to scientists, scientists talking to practitioners. Um, I had one teacher, I went to a professional development and I started with, so tell me a little bit about some of the problems you have in your classroom. And she looked at me with this look of, of, of just complete shock at first. And she said, but you're a neuroscientist. And, and I said, well, I, I know, but I said, I, I do want to hear. And she said, well, it's not going to be relevant. And I'm like, why are you at a professional development with me? If you think that what I, if you think I don't think your problems are relevant. Um, it was a very interesting conversation. And I will say that part of this is also driven just by experience. There's a lot of the work I've done over the years. I used to actually separate here's my outreach and here's my research. And I started to realize how much those were impacting each other because what the teachers were saying to me um, was actually helping to shape even the way I thought about my basic science. So um, this is sort of avoid just being the talking head. You know, we are often the experts coming in with knowledge for the teachers, but we need to hear what they say as well. OK. So I'm going to end on just the parting thoughts. Um, first, I just want to say that I think, though I've kind of taken a bit of a negative slant on a lot of this to say, oh, there's problems, there's problems, there's problems, I actually do think it's a really exciting time to be part of the science of learning because it has this potential to strongly impact areas like education. Um, education itself is interdisciplinary. Science of learning is interdisciplinary. And so I think that there's a natural relationship here that we really could exploit if we start thinking about it carefully. I think we're actually poised for this kind of impact as well as impact on the fun foundational knowledge as well. Um, so for me, this is you know, just a great space to be in. Um, the second is that I talked about translation-minded or practice-minded, uh, if you're talking about education specifically, that translation-minded does not necessarily mean that your work is translational research. I'm not, suggest I'm not advocating for everyone in the room to suddenly shift and do translational research. I work, I work in more of an applied space. I don't do necessarily direct translational research. But being translation-minded simply means having that as part of the, the scheme. And then the last, which I'm going to just emphasize one more time, is that the research practice gap really does require genuine crosstalk between scientists and practitioners in order to make a difference. And so my hope is that um, this is really just the start of this kind of conversation. What we need is some models to actually drive it. We need to be thinking more about how do we create these various things. As I said, figuring out the steps that it takes to go from one to the other. Um, and I'm going to, Dan's going to probably get up there and talk a little more specifically about some, you know, some of the specific areas. But I'm really hoping that this is the start of, of the way we um, sort of move into this space. And with that, I will again thank everybody. I know it's getting to be the end of the day. I appreciate your attention. Dave's got to help this one over there, and then Dave. Um, I'm just curious. Now, we all have had uh, plenty of anecdotes and studies about the persistence of um, students with misconceptions about how they go you know, on. And we've all seen how they can wallpaper over a misconception, have the, the uh, sufficient explanation that is scientific and, and even uh, regurgitated on the exam. And so we've trained them, and then yet the misconception persists. And I guess I'm just curious as to what do we know about what is necessary? How do we go about removing 
the misconceptions. They have to be done first before you can really layer on the new knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, and what do we know in this uh, neuroscience sense? How do you re unlearn something, if you will, or learn a new, a better paradigm shift? I mean, I can, I can answer that primarily from the standpoint of how we think about this in, in the context of, um, of these really strongly persistent myths, um, less so for, say, in a classroom where you've taught one concept. And, but the myths themselves persist because they're often comfortable and they're often validated. So take learning style. It's not a big surprise that those have persisted because yeah. someone who comes and say they do a workshop on, on you know, neuroscience and we teach them, let's say we do a workshop and we teach them that the learning styles data suggests doing that's not necessarily helpful. If I haven't gotten them to really buy into why, buy into the evidence for it, buy into the strength of it, or I haven't done that enough. So one question here is how much is enough training? So you notice neuroscience experts didn't, didn't have problems with um, some of these pieces. Um, but you know, so what is really enough training? So if I don't do enough training, and now the teacher goes back into their setting, their classroom, it doesn't have to be a teacher, we go back into life, and all around us, it's really easy to see something like learning styles persist. For example, um, I like information visually. I will fully confirm that if you gave me a learning styles inventory, I would come out as someone who'd be labeled as a visual learner. I love graphs, I like to put graphics up, I'm very, very comfortable with things being presented to me visually. If I'm not very, very knowledgeable about the fact that that still shouldn't drive how I learn things, and in fact, if anything, I should challenge my other, my other modalities some, um, I'm going to fall back into that. So if a teacher goes back into a classroom, her, her goal or his goal that day is going to be to deal with these 30 kids that, that are there. And in many cases, thinking about it that way is just an easier way to go back to. And in fact, we've built a lot of educational tools around that. So all of the resources that I have have those pieces in mind as well. And that makes it just very challenging. So I think we're still going to have to figure out, so what would it take? And how important is it us, for us to change it at a system level as well so that that can infiltrate down? And that's a problem that maybe isn't necessarily for those of us in the direct research realm, but it's certainly something that should be part of the conversation. That is what at the system level needs to change as well. I have uh, two questions. One is, is there a single example of some fundamental fact from neuroscience that has made it into educational practice, anything? Anything at all. And second, what happened to the relationship between education and psychology? I mean, who needs neuroscience anyway? <laughs> I mean, don't we have perfectly good psychological theories that should uh, have primacy over weird integration of uh, neurobabble into incoherent classroom practices? So as a cognitive psychologist prior to being a neuroscientist, um, I actually, so in a lot of cases, I've kind of conflated the, the cognitive science and the neuroscience here. I think. And the rationale for that has been actually to get to your point would be that I think when we're starting to talk to teachers, we should actually default first to what we what do we know about cognitive science? There's a whole lot in cognitive science that we have in, in, in psychology that has not gotten into the educational system. And for the same reasons I'm pointing out here. Um, the interesting thing about that is there is there hasn't been this cognitive education. It's neuroeducation. Actually, if you look at the neuroeducation programs, the bulk of it is, is psychology and cognitive science with a little marker added to it for neuroscience. And maybe that has to do with the persuasive nature of the neuroscience. They tag it with a brain image, and it makes it more satisfying. Um, we have to wrestle with why that is and what we do about that. We know that's true in the media. We know it's true in the educational realm. Um, so I actually would largely agree with you that a lot of what we could translate um, could be done from what we know about the psychology of learning. Um, I tend to group all those things kind of into the big bundle of science of learning. Oh, I knew you were going to come back to that. <laughs> Did you see me try to dodge that? <laughs> um, <laughs> directly from neuroscience into education. I mean, the closest one is a dyslexia case where the things that have been developed for dyslexia are actually helping with reading programs now in ways that I don't think would have happened if there hadn't been that shift in the dyslexia. So that's removed, but it's got the right steps. Something direct. Um, like I said, I'm a big believer that you have to have these in-between steps. And in many cases, the in-between steps are a better understanding of the cognition. I just want to offer one answer to David, which is unbelievably flat-footed. Um, sorry. I just want to 
offer one answer to David's question, which is, uh, my answer is somewhat flat-footed. I realized when I said it's flat-footed, I didn't mean your question. Um, but, but, you know, I think that, I, I think it's a point well taken that specific findings from neuroscience haven't properly made it into education, and maybe they shouldn't. But an awareness that change takes place in the brain and that brains can change with learning is enormously empowering to educators to think that when they are doing something, there's something going on in this organ and that that's a change. That, that in and of itself, it's not very profound in a way. It's not what we would sort of take as news, but I think that's actually very, very empowering. So that's all I have to say. Um, okay, uh, but, and also Amy showed us the evidence from Dina Weisberg and uh, Frank Kyle that um, if you stick in some, some totally pointless, doesn't help anything, brain references, mumbo jumbo, in your description, people rate it higher, okay? So, so unlike Howard Gardner's multiple, intelli multiple ways of being a learner, here we have very good evidence that there are multiple ways to be a human learner. You could pay attention to the psychology and apply that, or you could pay attention to some mumbo jumbo about the brain and apply and try and apply that. And the data show us that humans are very strongly in favor of hearing things about what lights up and what does that. And so the teachers are just humans like any other humans. They just want to hear about that, and they just want to learn that way. Although I would say, as Amy said for the Gardner work, sometimes hearing things the way you want to hear them isn't the best thing for you. <laughs>